from the University of California, Irvine. This is UCI Minds Spotlight on Care, the podcast where we share stories, experiences, tips, and advice on caring for loved ones affected by Alzheimer's and other dementias. Hello, and welcome to Spotlight on Care. I'm Virginia Nave, and I'm here with my co-host, Steve O'Leary. Today, our topic regarding Alzheimer's caregiving will touch on issues relating to getting a diagnosis, and our guest will tell you what that was like for her and her mom. Before I introduce our guest, Steve, can you tell us what was going on in your head when you first decided to make the call to a doctor or a specialist regarding your wife, Patty? Yeah, I think we were both scared. Uh, certainly Patty was scared that, you know, she knew she had some memory issues and she was afraid that the diagnosis might show something bad. And uh, it did. But on the other hand, you know, without a doubt, getting the diagnosis was the best thing that we possibly could do. It gave Patty from the very beginning um, confidence in knowing exactly what was wrong with her. It gave her confidence in talking to friends and neighbors about her disease when somebody would say, how's she doing? She was very upfront, I have Alzheimer's. It also helped her as the disease progressed. You know, when she was worrying about something, I would remind her that she has Alzheimer's. Of course, that was momentary, but at least it gave her confidence she would go, oh yeah, I know. And, uh, and so I think from the very beginning, all the way through her disease, Knowing uh, that she had Alzheimer's was definitely an asset for her and certainly was an asset for me as well. I'm so impressed with how you did that. Um, you know, everybody has a different experience. And I think that your experience was pretty positive And you really had a grip on what was going on. I I didn't. I really didn't. My experience with getting a diagnosis was uh, really interesting to say the least, but let me tell you how that went. Mm -hmm. Mom's general practitioner was not helpful with my questions about what was happening to mom. So after oh, six months of wrestling around with this, I thought I need, I need a specialist of some sort. So I picked a neurologist not knowing a thing about him, which was my first mistake. <laughs> so I called their office and they mailed to me a six to seven page questionnaire to fill out about mom's symptoms and behaviors. So I did. And then telling mom we were going to see a doctor when she felt fine was really awkward. But she agreed and I said we'd have a really nice lunch after the appointment. So I got to the neurologist's office. We were ushered back to a lovely room with a large mahogany desk. The doctor came in, introduced himself, and spread my questionnaire on the top of his desk. He read much of it, kind of going over it with his finger. And he looked up at me and he said, I see here that you don't think your mother can balance her checkbook any longer. I felt my face getting red and hot. I looked over at mom and she had her arms crossed over her chest. And she said, well, I bet I can balance it better than you can. <laughs> so much for seeing a professional. I, I, I was furious, I was embarrassed, and I felt horrible for my mom. He looked at me and he, he asked me to go wait in the waiting room. <laughs> so I did. And he gave mom a small written test. And then I was called back to his office. And he said to me that it appeared that mom was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease. He said it right in front of her. He sent us home with a seven day SAMP pack of Aricept and an order for an MRI brain scan. We got into the elevator to go down to the parking lot and it was torture for me. I, I thought I had done irreparable damage to my mother-daughter relationship. And then mom looks at me and she said, so where are we going for lunch? 
I was nauseous. But mom had absolutely no recollection of what had happened in that office. None. So <laughs> that was my experience getting official an official diagnosis of Alzheimer's for my mom. Uh, needless to say, we did not go back to that doctor. And my takeaway from that experience was that I should have gotten a referral from someone um, to find a doctor who was at least compassionate. Well, that's a great story, Virginia. I think that that's probably more common than my story. And, uh, and I think it's true. Um, you know, some neurologists we know uh, even talk about the fact that they think that you know, a, a hospital diagnosis or a, a university diagnosis is a much more professional way to go uh, just to clarify all the issues. And I was fortunate enough to start at UCLA and then I moved down to UCI and um, I always felt like I was dealing with somebody who had that kind of compassion that you're talking about. Yeah, you did it. You did it the right way. <laughs> well, it's now time to introduce our guest for this podcast. Her name is Lisa Updegraff. She lives in Los Angeles and her mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's about five years ago. Welcome, Lisa. We are very glad that you are here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this really important work you're doing, Virginia. Well, thank you. We're hoping to help a lot of people. Now, Lisa, tell us about your mom. What was she like before getting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? Well, my mom was really dynamic and she went to Stanford. And in those days, in the 50s, women weren't really encouraged to have big careers outside the home. She found herself in volunteer work and she started many different things, including the LA Opera Associates. She was the first woman president. She started the Ann Banning Auxiliary at the Assistance League. She was quite the mover and shaker and dynamic and funny and bright and then raised us and my sister and myself and then sort of had a midlife crisis, decided that she wanted to start to sing. So her friends were lovely, and once a year, this started probably in her 70s, uh, she would put together a cabaret act, and she would create all this stage patter and movement and songs, and she'd rent out venues in Hollywood, and her friends would come and see her. And I firmly believe that this is one of the reasons why she staved off her her ultimate Alzheimer's diagnosis as long as she did because she was using her brain and she was using music. And so it was, uh, she was really very vibrant, very vibrant until the diagnosis about five years ago. Wow. She sounds like an unbelievably talented person. And she and, was, she was. Yeah. And, and that's the saddest part is you, and I know that this mirrors of what a lot of people say about their loved ones who, who you see the steady decline is you see that part of them slowly subside and yeah. it's heartbreaking. What, what were the first signs that you noticed that made you think you better move forward with a diagnosis? Well, my mom, Never a great driver. <laughs> Never a great driver. Uh, she was having a series of accidents, culminating with a really bad one. And so I took her to a, a new doctor I found who was affiliated with UCLA. It's an internist. And because I really, the motivation was to stop her from driving. I, I didn't really think about Alzheimer's per se. She wasn't she wasn't repeating stories or forgetting things in a way that I noticed measurably. It was more the accidents. And she's a very proud and a very smart woman. She could cover herself if she ever did make any verbal gaffes. So we went to see this new doctor and in the family history, it came out that her, my mom's younger brother, four years younger, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 70. My mom at this point was what, 80, 81, something like that, 82. And so that coupled with the fact that my, their father, my grandfather, who was quite brilliant, had terrific dementia, which now knowing more about Alzheimer's clearly was, was an Alzheimer's diagnosis. 
the doctor who was uh, wonderful and her own stepmother had early onset Alzheimer's said, you know what, I think we should have her tested for Alzheimer's. And that began our journey. And it was I surprised when the ultimate diagnosis happened? No, I wasn't because of the family history, but she wasn't forgetting things. It wasn't what you normally would hear. It was really wanting to keep her from driving and endangering other people. That was my motivation. But God, you know, thank God. Didn't you mention something about her seeing a crazy thing from space land on her car? <laughs> yeah, she called me. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to laugh. Or <laughs> what else can you do? <laughs> what else can you do? <laughs> yeah, she called me. It was Memorial Day weekend. We were all supposed to meet at the beach um, as a family. And she called me and she said, Lisa, you won't believe what just happened. I, I, I think this, this triangular cone object fell from the sky and hit my car. <laughs> and, and I thought, what? And she said, maybe it was a UFO. And I thought, okay, well, and I didn't want to become too alarmed because I wanted her to get home. I made sure she was safe and I, um, she got home and it, but she'd had a terrible accident, but she, mm. I think somehow her brain she had some sort of brain blip or something. So that with, she wasn't cognizant that she'd had this horrible accident. She just thought something, <laughs> some UFO had yeah. dropped from the sky and hit her hood. Yeah. And I thought that was odd. And of course the doctor agreed that that was odd. Mm -hmm. And um, definitely we should, it couldn't hurt to have the, run the battery of tests that they do at UCLA. What type of doctor did you visit? And how did you know to visit a certain type of doctor? Well, we were very lucky because this new uh, internist was affiliated with UCLA. She sent us straight to the Alzheimer's uh, uh, Department of Neurology. So we initially, she, my mom went through a battery of tests, um, CT scans, MRIs, uh, saw a psychiatrist, a geriatric psychiatrist who evaluated her and then a, a, a neurologist who went again, went through the tests with her mm -hmm. um, that they do for Alzheimer's. So we, they have an extraordinary program at UCLA as I'm sure they do at UCI. And so they were able to, to we just sort of plugged mom in to their, to their uh, process and we got the diagnosis. And they, they, they look at the individual from such a, a holistic uh, way. They, there's, so, there's so many different tests and so many different ways of, of looking at memory and looking at um, patterns of behavior that they were able to do a very conclusive diagnosis. So we were very lucky. We were just very blessed all the way along to- that, That's changed a lot since I had <clears throat> to have mom diagnosed in <clears throat> 2005. Um, they've come a really long way with a battery of testing that they can do to figure out actually if it's something other than dementia. There are certain things that can cause strange behavior and memory loss. But did they prescribe any drugs for your mom? Well, of course, they put us on, put mom on the regimen of Namenda and Aricept basically as a cocktail to hopefully prevent or stave off any more erosion, um, but, but they didn't know. And they were very honest. They said, this may do absolutely nothing. And my mother, who was very, very holistically oriented, uh, I grew up in a family where the, the, she went to naturopaths and uh, acupuncturists and healers, and she believed only in doing things in a very natural, holistic way. She refused to take the medicine. Um, and I, at that point, my sister and I were very proactive and immediately we went to a lawyer. I got power of attorney so that, cause we were, we vowed to be one step ahead of, of mom's deterioration. So I made the decision that it couldn't hurt to try these things. And to tell you to this day, Virginia, I have no idea if they've done anything or not. Yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to hurt her. They put her on a, cause of her agitation 
and her anxiety, which and her um, physical abuse, she would get very physical, especially with me. We put her on a antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And then what has been added to the mix as she has progressed is Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic. And that helps with the the uh, hallucinations mm -hmm. and um, again, the aggressive behavior. Um, so it was... I, I have no idea if anything is working, but I know that she seems calm most of the time and happy most of the time. And that's all I can ask for. Did they, did they say in the beginning that it was mild cognitive impairment or did they go right into the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? They went right into the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And the one thing I have to say, this was a, five years ago, the, the, I would sort of corner whatever doctor was dealing with my mother at the time and say, don't say Alzheimer's, don't say dementia. She's very proud. She's very narcissistic. She will not handle it well. So I, whatever, whatever they spoke to mom, the doctor spoke to mom, they were very, uh, they couched their language in sort of subterfuge. <laughs> so they didn't yeah. say, so you have Alzheimer's, you know, get your affairs in order. There's nothing more we can do for you. So that what they gave me all sorts of resources to try and stimulate her and keep her engaged. And my mom didn't really want to do any of those things. And that was the source of um, tremendous sadness for, for me. And that was the hardest part in my learning how to be a caretaker is a, keeping mom safe, but allowing her the dignity of choice and free will. Yes. I could present ideas to her, but if she refused to do them because she, I think in her mind, she knew deep down in her soul, I think she knew that there was something wrong. But she didn't want to admit it. And to go to a swimming pool at the Y and take a class with people with Parkinson's, which is the only thing I could find that was safe for her, she refused. Or art therapy for people with dementia, she refused. I mean, time after time after time, there's a program that my, my uncle was very involved in, um, and it started in uh, Los Angeles, and now it's kind of uh, countrywide, called Music Men's Minds. And it they had a band called The Fifth Dementia, and they, it was extraordinary. My, my uncle played the piano and everybody had some form of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or dementia, and they would practice twice a week and then give shows once a quarter. And it was just lovely and touching and fabulous. And all these people were, were in the band were former musicians one way or the other. My mother refused because even though she had the cabaret act, she wanted to be the star of the show. And that's not how it worked. I was just so, going to say, I'll bet she loved that. And she didn't. She hated it. She hated oh. the idea. And it was a band for, it was called the Fifth Dementia. So it was four people with dementia. She didn't like that at all. <laughs> but it's an extraordinary program. And I certainly would urge any of your listeners, if they have parents that are loved ones that, that were musical at uh, at any in any way to look into it it's uh it's an amazing program i have no idea what they're doing right now i think everything is virtual but hopefully we'll all come out of that and uh it provides community and and the one thing i think we both have learned is that community is very important in keeping your brain healthy and functioning and vibrant and what Absolutely. happens a lot of time is people with with Alzheimer's is they become recluses because it's uh, people don't know how to handle it. And I'm sure you felt with your mom and I, I know with my mom, I'm good until I'm not. I can hear yeah. the same question 69 times and answer sweetly. <laughs> and then I sat and on the 70th time you've had you, it. You've had it and you're mean yeah. and you feel so bad because yeah. they like don't know that they've asked 69 times my so. my brother has a funny story of when he was driving mom around one time and she said uh where are we and he said mission viejo mom 
She goes, ah, a couple seconds later, where are we? Goes, Mission Viejo, mom. On the third time, she goes, where are we? And he said, Rancho Cucamonga, mom. <laughs> she, goes, she goes, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> he was better at handling repeat questions than I was. <laughs> I don't want to think about how I reacted. <laughs> That's priceless. Let, oh, I love let's it. Let's get into the subject a little bit of caregiving. Where are you now on your mom's caregiving? Uh, as I understand it, she's in her own home, which is lovely. Tell us, tell us, uh, tell us how the caregiving is going now. Well, we, my sister and I, felt that we, well, we realized that mom, because she told us, wanted to die in the house. And so we are moving mountains to keep her there. She doesn't want a pal. She doesn't want anybody else to bathe her. She doesn't have Alzheimer's. She's quite fabulous and tells me she looks 65 and quite wonderful. And my father just passed away a year ago. And so now she wants it. She, she asked about going on dating sites what do I suggest? Oh. So my mom is really living in complete illusion. Uh, so we have full-time care. We have for quite a while uh, housekeepers. That's And so they. she loves to eat. She doesn't remember she's just eaten. So she's gained quite a bit of weight, but that's fine because it's better than the alternative, which is forgetting to eat at all, which is what happens with a lot of Alzheimer's patients. So she has somebody with her to make sure she doesn't fall. She's in a walker that now she uses. And she is safe. We, I, I had a social worker from UCLA Alzheimer's program come out to the house and basically kind of baby proof it. Tell me what to take away, where to put bars in the bathrooms, in the showers, uh, rugs, area rugs to take away. Uh, it's a one story house, uh, thankfully. So mom is as safe as she can be. She's well fed. The housekeepers, uh, she's incontinent, um, which is unfortunate. But I go over at least four or five times a week to run around with my dog who gives her unconditional love, talk about the beautiful view of the city and shower her. And right. She sings show tunes to me while I'm showering her at the top of her lungs, which I know I will miss when she passes. So I try you to enjoy will. it. You will. You'll miss that. Mm -hmm. And so for right now, we are one step ahead. We were planning on if she needs a pal to help her uh, dress her or whatever, that, that's our next step. We're trying to keep her at home. We do know that uh, some pa some patients are go into assisted living, and mom is too aware still to accept it. And we're afraid with her personality, she'll be booted out <laughs> because she <laughs> can be quite difficult. So we're really we're really kind of saving ourselves the the headache of of mom like being bouncing from. Uh, care to care. So that's what we're doing. And we're just, you know, everything is evolving and everything is fluid and everything is uh, dynamic and not static. So we're aware that this is fine for today, but tomorrow things may shift. And I'm, I'm glad you know that now. Yeah. <laughs> that's and, a good and thing have to a know lot now. Of, and have a lot of resources. I would uh, urge your listeners, I'm sure UCI has the same sort of resource resources as UCLA, mm -hmm. but there are many different, they can, my mom sees a, um, a, uh, a caseworker uh, who has been able to make recommendations for different agencies or different programs. There's a lot of resources out there that you don't really necessarily know about. And you feel when you get the diagnosis, you feel frightened and stymied and, and yes, overwhelmed. Yes. And there's a lot out there now, a yes, lot yes. out there now to help you guide you and to making the next steps. And you won't always do the right thing. And it's okay not to, it's so okay. everything is a learning experience. None of us really know what we're going through with this. And, and the worst part is 
that it it can be difficult with the with the, our parents or our loved ones not wanting to accept the diagnosis and not wanting to try new things or do new things to to help themselves so it's being patient with ourselves and kind i was going to wrap up by by saying what advice do you have for people in your position but i think you just uh summed it up beautifully uh, oh. you have to reach out for help it's out there information is out there education is out there and the sooner you do it the better absolutely amen I, and uh and if, if you if you try one place and it doesn't work, there's so many different places online to get resources in your area yes. that just because one one doctor is unkind or you don't find the program that fits for you and your family. And there's there's just a lot of resources out there. And certainly we both are big uh, uh, fans of Maria Shriver who started the women's yes. Alzheimer movement. And she, if you subscribe to their newsletter, there's a blog, there's certainly a ton of information that comes through every week on all the new programs are out there, the best exercises, brain uh, food activities you can do. Because I think what Virginia, you and I have talked about a lot is what do we do for ourselves? Yes. Not wanting to know if we got that have that gene or not that will express or not express and what can we do for our own lives to prevent the ultimate diagnosis of alzheimer's you hear it all the time now the best thing to do is to make lifestyle changes and we have control over that we don't really have control if we have one or two copies of the apoe4 gene but right. whether they express um we we do have some control over that and there's studies on that every day and UCI is actually doing quite a bit on uh, on those uh, research issues. So I, you know, thank you so much for your time. Um, very valuable, wonderful advice, good stories. Everyone's gonna have their own story and it'll be a little bit different from yours and from mine, but um, we sure appreciated your being here today. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Virginia. All right. I'll talk bless. soon. Bye. Spotlight on Care is produced by the University of California, Irvine, Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders, UCI Mind. Interviews focus on personal caregiving journeys and may not represent the views of UCI Mind. Individuals concerned about cognitive disorders, prevention, or treatment should seek expert diagnosis and care. Please subscribe to the Spotlight on Care podcast wherever you listen. For more information, visit mind.uci.edu.